Hey everyone, welcome back to Beyond the Bar podcast. I'm your host, Denise Satova. Today we're diving deep with Catherine Miller. She's a seasoned collaborative lawyer and a mediator with more than oof, 30 years under her belt. Catherine is the founder of the Miller Law Group. She's the past president of the New York Association of Collaborative Professionals, and she's also a host of her own podcast called Dialogue on Divorce. Not only is she an author, but she's an influential voice in the arena of social justice and family issues. And you, you know, you'll find out where that passion comes from in just a second. She, she has a great story. So I'm thrilled to have you here, Catherine. I'm so thrilled to be here with you, Denise. Thank you for inviting me. You know, you have a family background in therapy and also personal experience of going through divorce. How has all of that shaped your journey in, in becoming, I would say, a special kind of a lawyer? Yeah, well, you know, I went to law school because I was interested in justice, and I realized in the orientation week that that is not what law school was going to be about. And in fact, that's not really what the practice of law is about either. I had no plan B. So I thought, well, I come from a, life, a family of therapists, and I've always really been interested in people. So I decided to focus my legal education and my legal career on the intersection of the law where it meets people in their personal lives. And uh, so I got a job in family law out of law school and I started to work in the field and we were doing half matrimonial divorce work and half child welfare litigation. It was a lot of time in court. I tried many cases in front of Judge Judy when she was actually sitting on the bench in the New York City Family Court. And after a couple of years of that, I took a mediation training, Denisa, because I thought, wow, there really has to be a better way to help the people who we are, at least in their divorces, uh, to resolve the issues that need to be resolved because what we're doing is really disruptive to their lives. It's terrifying for them and it's super expensive. And it's also time consuming. It's taking a way longer time than maybe it could be. So I took the mediation training and I started to try to introduce those mediative ideas of settling based on what was important to the people, their own personal priorities and criteria, rather than maybe legal principles. And there's a lot of overlap, but the emphasis is different. And in every single case, I ran into the same problem. And that problem was the other lawyer, not that they were bad people or bad lawyers. In fact, we just couldn't get on the same page as to how we were going to settle the cases and what, what we were going to use in order to reach a settlement. Now, you have to understand that in New York, 97%, 97% of divorces settle before a judge makes a decision after a trial. So we were settling, we we're all settling and all good lawyers, I'm sure many of your other guests are telling you that we're settling our cases, but we just, it was a lot more of a struggle when we're settling based on the law, which might or might not be important to the people. Fast forward 10 years, I was getting divorced myself. I had two little children and I was really quite afraid of what a custody litigation might mean for them and for me and for my ex-husband. And after that experience, which although we were unable to mediate, we settled in a very collaborative like setting in a conference room and never went to court. Uh, after that experience, I thought, you know, I just can't do this anymore. I and I quit my job. And I moved out of New York City to Westchester County, and I looked around for something else to do with my life, and I considered some other things. Uh, I got remarried, I had another child, and I took another mediation training, and I was doing some mediation and some consulting, and someone suggested that I come and take a collaborative divorce training. And I was like, come on, 10 years, same problem, other lawyer, how could this really be any different? And she said, you know, come along and do it anyway. I think you'll like it. And within 15 minutes in this collaborative training, I felt like I had come home, that the lawyers were working together to help the parties reach a resolution based on what was most meaningful to them, to the couple. And I had a guy who'd come in to talk to me the week before. He hadn't yet told his wife they were getting divorced. I literally called him from the train on the way home after the training. I was like, let's do it this collaborative way. And he said, okay. And from that moment on, Denise, that I was like, you know what? I think that this can be done. I think that we can, as lawyers, help people resolve their divorce conflict 
in a way that is respectful of their dignity and, and focused on their families. And so that's when I founded my firm and I've been doing it ever since. Well, it sounds like you have built a practice that is consistent with your principles. Um, and that is, you know, that is, that is absolutely phenomenal. If you were to run into somebody at an event and they're thinking about divorce and you introduce yourself as a, you know, as, as an attorney, someone who's familiar with the traditional model, I think many people still are, you know, you hire a lawyer, uh, you try to yeah. negotiate with the other side. It typically has to be an aggressive lawyer. How would you describe in simple terms what, how collaborative divorce is different than litigating model? Well, first of all, I would say to them that the most important decision that they have to make at this point in their lives and having made the decision to divorce or being told that a decision was being made that they were divorcing, the most important decision that at that moment is a choice of process. Right. So whether and just the, the choices that you're talking about, litigation, collaborative law, mediation or DIY, do it yourself. Uh, it's really hard to do that. I couldn't do it. So what I like to say is that they're all on a spectrum uh, between mm -hmm. trial, like going to court, hiring lawyers, going through a formal discovery process, which is what we call information sharing in the law. Uh, possibly motion practice to deal with issues that come up about information sharing or interim support or parenting and custody issues and, and going through that whole process and being on the court's calendar and being at the mercy of that calendar, but also of the court system. So your judge could change maybe more than one time throughout that process, throughout the preliminary hearings. Maybe the hearing is bifurcated. Maybe you have a custody hearing separate from a financial hearing. That's very likely to happen. And that it's very hijacking for your life because you're making, you're coming to court when it's convenient for the court, not when it's convenient for you. And not necessarily even convenient when it's, it's, it's good for your lawyers. On the other end of the spectrum is trying to figure it out yourself. Now, it's really hard to do that when you've been married more than five minutes and you have assets or children or anything because of the emotional overlay, because marriage is so many things. It's a financial partnership. It's a legal relationship. It's an intimate partnership. It's a parenting partnership. And all of these things are kind of intertwined together. And in between those two polar extremes, there are these two other options. And in mediation, people usually work with a mediator and that mediator might be a lawyer, but the lawyer is not one person against the other or the other against the first. It's person, that person can get, provide legal information, but also helps them uh, decide on what the issues are they need to resolve, gather the information that they need to resolve them and talk to them about what's important to each of them. And then goes through a brainstorming session about what possible outcomes are there and then compare those options against what's important and what's possible. And through that process of back and forth, brainstorm, evaluate, brainstorm, evaluate, ultimately reach an agreement. And lawyers are present, in, but they might not be present in the room. So the, each person, mm -hmm. each spouse has an attorney, but the attorneys in New York are generally outside the room. Sometimes they're in the room, sometimes they're in the room for the whole mediation, but sometimes they're in the room just for difficult pieces of it. The lawyers are not generally disqualified from litigating if things break down in the mediation session, but they're there as advisors and support for the couple as they go through the divorce process. In collaborative law, uh, each party has their own attorney and that's part of the way the collaborative works. The, the lawyers are disqualified by contract from litigating. So everybody signs an mm. agreement at the beginning that these lawyers and their law firms will not participate in a litigation should the, the the collaboration break down and now it rarely does but it's right there to make sure that everybody's 100 percent honest no lawyer is thinking well if it doesn't work here i'll just go file a motion and we can see in court and and also uh the collaborative divorce model has become an interdisciplinary model so we work with financial professionals as neutrals to help understand the money and to help us evaluate options and what they will look like going forward and how they might change over time and what the impact of each of those financial options are on the net worth of each of the parties in the future. And also uh, we work with mental health professionals who can deal with conflict dynamic issues that where a couple reaches a place where they're really unable to resolve conflict because they get kind of stuck in a, in a 
very familiar uh, fight uh, that in, many people are very familiar with that feeling, yeah. but also with parenting issues. And it's kind of just built into the structure that gonna, we're going to approach the divorce with this inter, interdisciplinary uh, approach. And, and, but we're also going to stay out of court. And so I think it's really clear for people, you know, they're the decision makers in all but the litigation model. They are the people driving the process, but it's various levels of support from DIY, virtually no support, mediation with some support and guidance from the mediator and the collaborative process, which creates a whole like container around them and allows them to go through the negotiations in a very supportive way. Wow, a lot of many different options. Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, people may not be thinking long term in, in the, the very sort of a throat of, of the conflict, but eventually, you know, you will think that you want to move forward toward healing, you know, not only if children are involved, but there's so many ripple effects of, of the divorce, you know, the relationships that you had built with your relatives and friends and instead of having them choose a side so it really impacts so many different layers so many different people so if it is so important that you choose the right resolution model um and that you interview professionals and become really comfortable um so that's uh, that that is a Absolutely. great sort of a rundown of, of of these options you know you and i spoke briefly about um you know we're all human beings, even even as professionals. Yes, we are. And, you know, you, you mentioned I asked you, so what, what do you do when you sort of a hit, uh, you know, when you are when you are working with with a couple, whether it's a mediator or a collaborative attorney and, you know, you're noticing, right, that it may be sort of hitting your stuff. Uh, and uh, you, you said that you, you actually lean into it. Uh, and, and become curious, you know, can you share a time where your vulnerability became your strength? Yeah, I can. Um, I can think of a, of a couple of of, a, of a scenarios or stories for you. You know, um, one time I remember in a mediation, uh, the, the couple was really, really uh, stuck, and we were having the same conversation for a few sessions. And uh, I had and they came back in for another session, and I said to them, you know. I've been thinking about you and, you know, I think maybe I'm going about this wrong. And, you know, and just sort of taking ownership for the difficulty. Now, it wasn't just me, you know, but I was a part of it, you know, Denise, and I had been thinking about them. And in my own personal time, I was thinking about this family. And, and so I wanted to tell them that, that they had affected me personally and that I thought I, could have done something different that would help them. And then we could, that, that allowed us to take a step back and talk about what we could do differently. And they were able to get through it and, and to resolve it. Um, so hmm. that, that's, that's one thing. You know, and another thing that comes up, you know, in the mediator's chair, and this is not a specific situation, but this kind of thing happens a lot. Imagine you, you have a situation where uh, something comes up and then the couple has a whole like private conversation, but right in front of me or right in front of the mediator. And then, you know, it's a little argument, it's a complete side conversation. And then uh, they just turn to me and say, all right, you know, let's just move on. And then I think to myself, well, what am I going to do with that? Because this very this this emotional thing just happened here, but I don't know what it was. And now they're telling, but they're also now telling me to move on, and this is their process. So when that happens, you know, what I've found when I, if I say, you know, I really am not sure what to do here, because mm. on the one hand, you just had an emotional conversation, tears were shed, voices were raised, and. And it was obviously meaningful to both of you, but on the other hand, you're telling me just to move on. And and I feel hmm. like, I don't know what that was. I don't want to move on, but that's still in the room. You know, what should we do? Instead of pretending I know what to do. And and because I don't, wow. but, and usually then wow. Denise, they'll, they'll tell me a little bit about like what happened, like what that was about. And then I feel more comfortable moving on. And, and, and it's kind of an interesting thing because 
uh, it, it, I really, just by sharing my own uncertainty in that moment, mm. I feel like it makes it, it's actually safer for them to talk rather than yeah. scarier. Yeah, you have a choice to make. You're right. You, you can put on this sort of a facade. Well, you know, OK, let's move on, because sometimes when people say that, I think that the, 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 the reaction from the, uh, the professional could be or even someone just listening could be ooh, sign of relief. Oh, I'm glad I don't exactly. have to deal with what could possibly come. It's like, OK, exactly. instead, you truly are leaning into it. I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm curious here. And it's it's the uncertainty of the outcome because you don't know what's coming at you, right? But you're right. So that's really, you know, I, I get I get so excited about this because that's being vulnerable, being human. And I think people going through this transition, they're already down. They're at their sort of I, I say act of their shadow side. And, you know, they're embarrassed, they feel a sense of shame, and to sort of treat them, you know, like criminals or they're lesser than you know, it, it's just, it just fuels the conflict. So that is wonderful. You know, I know that you have this deeply rooted interest in social justice. <laughs> if you could meet any social justice leader, past or present, who who would that be and, and why? That's a great question. Um, I think that I would really like to meet Gandhi. <laughs> Mm. And, and I think um, because I think that Gandhi really lived his principles and was able to uh, give advice and act in, in alignment. There's a story about Gandhi where a woman brings her child to him and says, I need, I need you to tell my son to stop eating so much sugar. And he says, all right, go away and come back in a month. And so that she brings him back, the son back in a month. And, and Gandhi says, don't eat so much sugar. And she, and the mother says to him, why couldn't you say that last month? And he said, because last month I was also eating too much sugar. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that, is, that is so powerful. But wow. it's like, okay, you know, you have to really sort of know, know the pain or n at least have some compassion for what it is that you're asking people to do. And on a small scale like that, a, a, a mother with her son who eats too much sugar, but also on a societal scale and be able to govern from that perspective as well. Yeah. Wow. And he was so selfless, all, all the suffering uh, he, he, he went yes. through, but he, he sort of set his personal self aside um, and uh, all the preferences and it, it was not important. It was, it was not about him. Um, yeah, that, that, that is a true strength. Um, wow. So talking about reset, what, what is your ideal way to reset? Um, spend the weekend, uh, what, what would you do? If you were not meeting with clients, now I'm not saying if you were not working, I don't know, it looks differently for different people. Yeah. What, what do you do? Well, I have a large family because I'm remarried. We have a blended family. So we each had a son and a daughter and a dog. And now we have a daughter together, but she's 21 now. So it's not like any of these children are still at home, but I still love to spend time with them. And I'm also a very serious horseback rider and a competitive dressage rider. So I spend a lot of uh, time with my horses as well. Do you find it therapeutic? So therapeutic. I cannot, I, I don't know that I could do what I do uh, if, if I didn't have that in my life. Wow. Now, I had no idea that that is, there's something so freeing. Um, is there a feeling? Can you describe the feeling when you are near your horses? Well, you know, there's a, a few things. One is that horses don't communicate with language. They communicate with, of course, with body language, but also with with energy, if, if that makes any sense to you. And there's a, a way that the communication happens through a shared energy that is is pretty special. And it really 
it's it's very meditative because it it takes me out of my kind of prefrontal cortex and really kind of into my body and awareness of what my body is doing and what the, the horse's body is doing uh, when i'm on the ground when we're when i'm riding and there's this connection and you know dressage is like ballet or dance on horseback there's a there's this cycling of the energy where each participant the animal and the rider and the human are each bringing something to uh, the collaboration and the performance and that neither would do be able to do it without the other and and of course they're much 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 larger than we are so they have to want to do it they they get interested in doing it as well and that is something that it's really hard to put words to denisa I am obviously not watching you ride a horse right now, but as you're describing the energy, I am just like even more relaxed. Um, that's, uh, wow, that is that is just so wonderful and freeing. Um, so lastly, Catherine, because I can, I can talk to you forever and you'll be back, I know that we'll have you back. Um, you know, if you were, let me let me put a positive spin on it rather than focusing on mistakes. So new incoming practitioners, and when I say incoming, maybe practitioners who are wanting to get into mediation, the collaborative, um, try the collaborative model. You know, I'm sure you've seen your share of mistakes. Um, what advice would you give them um, before before they do that, or as they're transitioning into into uh, these models? Well, I think, you know, sooner is better than later, although it's sometimes it's, it, it's a good idea to have some sense of what, what divorce litigation is before you get into this uh, so that you have a sense of the spectrum. But I think that most people who, most lawyers or other professionals who get into divorce work find themselves sometimes hijacked by the dynamic in the couple. And that can be scary, but it's not scary. You know, what I sometimes think to myself is no matter how hot the dynamic is in the room, I'm safe. I'm sitting on the chair. I'm breathing. I'm going to go home tonight and have dinner with my family. I'm going to pat my dog. I'm going to go riding in the morning, you know, whatever it is. And that, that, and to stay grounded in who you are and not be so afraid of what, that what the ha what's happening in in for the couple and to and to stay in that humanity and in your own vulnerability of willingness to reach yeah. out as if they were your friends now they're not your friends they're your your clients they're people that are paying you for help but that if you think about it that way then i think it's a lot less scary that is a great advice so you're not becoming merged right because it's it's scary uh, it doesn't matter how, how many years you've done it, maybe not scary, but I, it, there is some, there has to be some shift and movement emotionally, as long as you sort of, you know, what's yours and what's theirs and, and yeah. remembering that you are providing much needed service. Yeah. And you, I mean, you, you feel that happening when I feel that happening, I feel like, oh, you know, my energy level is going up, my breath is coming faster, maybe I'm clenching my jaw or, or whatever. I think, wow, that's telling me something about what's happening in the room, right? That, that I am reflecting back something that's happening in the room and experiencing it physically. And if I say, all right, now I'm gonna take a few breaths and I'm gonna calm myself down and calming myself down actually has the impact of calming down the dynamic in the room. And that if I take that dynamic through my own, my own self, I can calm it or I can rev it up if need be, you know, depending on which way you want to go yeah. with that. And that that alone is having a huge impact without having to have them separate or, you know, get panicky or threatening. Because a lot of lawyers will be like, well, nah, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and a finger <laughs> waving and, you know, yeah. all that sort of happens. Like, well, that isn't really going to help. And, and right. if you just relax for a minute, say, well, what should we do here? Is this helpful? You're going to mm -hmm. get their attention a lot faster and a lot more effectively than you start wagging, you know, trying to put it down or squish them or whatever. Yeah. Wow. Catherine, it's been a true privilege to delve into your life and career. Thank you very much for sharing your unique and powerful, powerful, powerful perspective with us. 
It's so fun. Thank you for having me. So to all our viewers and listeners, to find out more about Catherine Miller, make sure to click on her bio link below and do not forget to hit subscribe button on our YouTube channel, Beyond the Bar Podcast, and follow us on all social media channels. And until next week, stay curious and inspired.